Okay, hi everyone. My name is Julie Sedoni and I am the librarian for class, the social science department. Thanks for being here today for our graduate student essentials workshop on planning and organizing a lit review. I'm really glad that you joined us um, for the session today. What we're gonna be focusing on specifically are a few different topics. We're gonna to be talking about planning and organizing a lit review, hence the title, as well as utilizing advanced search strategies to help you find sources that you can cite within your literature review. If you have any questions during this session, please feel free to type them in the Zoom chat box. My colleague Jessica Martinez is gonna be reading those questions to me at certain points throughout the session so that I can make sure to answer questions about things I've talked about or if you have any other questions about lit reviews that you'd like to ask. Oftentimes, um, when you have questions, it's likely that other people who are watching the workshop have similar questions. So please free, feel free to ask anything, um, and I, as well as Jessica, will do our best to answer those questions. So first off, what is a literature review? The most basic summary is that a literature review is an up-to-date or current overview of research on a particular topic. Literature reviews are often found in research articles and conference papers, as well as in theses and dissertations, both at the graduate level and then at the undergraduate level as well. You can also see reviews of the literature in things like books or book chapters, but they might be called something different. Usually when you see the heading for a literature review, that's something you're finding in a research article or a conference paper. What is the purpose of a literature review? A literature review shows readers where the author is entering the academic conversation on a particular topic. And it does, that, it does that in a couple of ways. First, it shows that you're able to identify gaps in the research. So by citing previous literature on a specific topic, you can start pointing out where research hasn't been done yet and maybe how you're going to fill those gaps with your own project. It also demonstrates that you as an author have an understanding of how your research fits within and expands the body of work on a particular topic. Whenever we're writing something like a lit review, whether it's for a research article, a conference paper, or a book chapter, or maybe even just a literature review assignment in one of our classes, we have to think about what's the appropriate scope for that literature review. There's no one size fits all answer. The scope of a literature review is going to reflect maybe your discipline. If you're looking to publish something, the journal or the location where you're trying to publish your research, um, as well as the type of publication you're creating. So the scope for a literature review within a dissertation might look very different than a scope for a literature review within a research article. Research articles, depending on the discipline, might only be 15 to 20 pages, whereas dissertations can be upwards of 100 or 200. So the literature review and the scope in each of those publications or um, types of writing, it's going to look different. So even though there's not one size fits all answer, there are some questions that you can, can consider when you're trying to figure out what scope you should focus on within your lit review. Think about how comprehensive does your lit review need to be? Do you need to cover the entire body of work on a particular topic, or are you maybe focusing just on one aspect of a topic? So, for example, let's say we're doing a lit review on political polarization in Congress. Are we just focusing on political polarization within a specific decade, within a specific party in Congress, amongst members from specific, specific states? What, is our, what comprehensiveness are we looking for? Think about whether your lit review will include all related material regardless of date, or if it will only focus on a specific time frame. Again, are you citing all of the literature in your lit review that has been published across time on your topic since this topic has first been researched, or are you focusing just on the last 10 years, potentially because your topic is focusing on something very new um, within this research area? If that's the case, you might just refer to some of the older or more important articles on your topic and then spend the bulk of your lit review on the most recent research uh, that relates to your topic. 
But again, for all of these questions, it's really going to, your answer is really going to depend on your discipline and what your goals are. So if you have questions about this, talk to uh, the faculty members who are teaching your classes, talk to your colleagues, um, talk to your advisors for your theses and dissertations to make sure you're identifying the right scope for your lit review. Another question to consider is, will your lit review include sources from other related disciplines? Oftentimes, research on a topic might, might cross multiple disciplines. It might be interdisciplinary in nature, or there might be research on your topic being conducted in an entirely different discipline. So think about whether you need to expand your search to include research from those other areas. And lastly, will your lit review include sources written in other languages? Depending on your topic, you may need to um, attempt to find research written, written in other languages. And that can be challenging, especially if you can't speak those languages. So if you do have questions about kind of finding research um, in other languages, um, you can always reach out to the library and we can do our best to help you. Um, and we can kind of refer you to um, some um, kind of tools or tricks to do some translation. Um, Microsoft Word does have the option to translate a document into another language. So oftentimes, if you can find an article, um, let's say in Spanish and you don't speak Spanish, if you can somehow import it into Microsoft Word, you can then translate it into English to at least get some form of understanding uh, to potentially be able to cite that within your lit review if that research is very important to your topic. Defining your scope early on in your research process is going to be really important. Having an idea of what you're looking for and what the what your criteria are and kind of what your um, limitations that you're placing on your own literature searching are from the beginning will help you manage that process. When you're doing a lit review, since it tends to be pretty comprehensive, it can be a bit intimidating to jump into this process because you might come across hundreds of articles related to your topic. So knowing what your scope is from the beginning will help you manage that process and it will also help you share and report on that process within your actual lit review or potentially like the method section of your research article if you need to specify how you searched, what decisions you made to limit um, the articles or the other sources that you found. Okay, so next let's talk a little bit about how you can organize a lit review. Again, organization of your lit review is going to differ based on your discipline, based on the type of publication or type of writing you're doing. Uh, but four of the main ways that literature reviews tend to be organized are by topic or concept. So you would group together the sources that you're citing kind of based on how they're talking about a specific topic or concept. So maybe let's go back to the, um, the example of political polarization in Congress. You might um, look at um, political polarization based on various factors. Maybe it's based on their constituents' demographics, who their constituents are. Maybe it's based on concerns about um, whether they can get reelected. You might, in your lit review, group all of the articles focused on constituent demographics and um, political polarization in one section of your lit review, and then the other section would be the articles that focus on reelection concerns and political polarization. Sometimes lit reviews are organized based on theory. If you are doing research that is focused um, or maybe built on specific theoretical constructs, you might group your literature review and the sources you find um, by different types of theory or theories. The same can be said about methods or methodologies. Um, you might choose to group the sources you're finding um, based on the methods or methodology used within those specific sources or within that specific research. Um, I haven't seen this in my, as much in the literature reviews that I have read, so this could be something that's much more discipline specific. Lastly, uh, lit reviews sometimes can be organized by publication date, or maybe you're reporting on the oldest um, research on a topic uh, first within your lit review, and then the last articles that you talk about are the, are the most recent research. This type of organizational structure can be helpful if you're trying to show how research or coverage um, or your discipline's understanding of a topic has changed over time. 
Um, but there are limitations potentially to organizing a lit review based on publication date because it might be harder to make connections between um, literature since it's so spread out based on publication date. So again, work with um, the faculty members, um, maybe who are teaching your classes, with your advisors, your colleagues, to figure out uh, the best way to organize and structure your lit review uh, before you actually start writing. Okay, so before we move on to the next section, um, does anyone have questions about the purpose, scope, or organizational options for lit reviews? And have we had any questions come through in chat yet, Jessica? No questions in chat yet, Jalisa. Okay, great. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and move to the next section. But again, if I'm going through and you are struck with a question about something we already talked about, go ahead and put that in chat. Okay, so now that we've talked about the purpose, scope, and kind of organizational strategies for lit reviews, let's talk a bit about how you can make connections between the sources you find. Connecting um, and kind of talking about the sources, um, making connections between them is very important. That's kind of the key part of a lit review. And this is very clear when we think about the difference between summaries and synthesis or syntheses. So with summaries, what your goal is, is to kind of share the key points from a single or from an individual source and then move on and summarize another source. So an example of summaries, when we're thinking about literature or sources are things like annotated bibliographies, where we have a single citation, you summarize that source and then you move on to the next citation um, or next reference in your source list. In contrast, a synthesis is where you choose to combine the information from multiple sources and add your own analysis, um, analysis of that literature. Usually this means that um, each of your paragraphs include, like within your lit review, each of your paragraphs will include citations to more than one source and you will be making connections between those sources. You'll be pointing out maybe their similarities, their differences, um, and you'll be adding in your own analysis. That's why um, lit reviews are so different than something like an annotated bibliography, because the goal with a lit review is to synthesize all of these sources to show how they're connected, show how they're similar, show how a specific research topic has changed or grown over time, as well as allow you to identify how your research and your topic is building on and adding to that literature that you've already found. So that's kind of the purpose of a lit review is to do that synthesis of sources. So one strategy is to use something called a synthesis matrix. And I'm going to show you a couple of, of examples of these through screenshots. And then we're going to share um, a link to a template that you can use to do your own um, synthesizing of sources you find. So a synthesis matrix um, is kind of a tool or a strategy to help you record the main points of every source you find and show how the sources relate to each other. So one example from Ashford University um, looks like this, where you can see um, across the top, so the first row are kind of the main points or maybe main topics that this specific author or writer wants to focus on within their lit review. That's across the top. So they're looking at anxiety in graduate students. So they're looking at something related to multiple ro roles, relationships, and classroom environment. Those are their main points they're focusing on. The left hand side, so that first column, is where they list the sources that they found. Then each cell and each cross section of the cell allows them to maybe write a few sentences that show um, how those specific sources talk about or fit within those different topics. So if we look at like the Ofstein, Larson, McNeil, and Mawali 2004 source, we can see that under the heading of multiple ro roles that the creator of the synthesis matrix is saying that graduate students, especially doctoral students, are expected to teach. But they haven't filled anything in within the relationship or the classroom environment cells, and that's okay. Blank cells, like you can see um, from the little 
kind of um, arrow on the screen um, from Ashford University's screenshotted uh, synthesis matrix. Blinks are okay because that just means that that specific article didn't really talk about or focus on those main points. Every article you find is not going to talk about or cover each of those main points or concepts or you know methods or things like that that you want to talk about in your lit review and that's okay. The benefit of doing something like a synthesis matrix is it helps you really quickly um, start to synthesize your research within these main concepts, but it also allows you to see where all of these different sources overlap with each other. So we can see that um, the um, Ofstein et al. et al. article talks about how graduate students are Especially, or especially doctoral students are expected to teach. If we look further down within the synthesis matrix, we can see that Salim 2011 also found that graduate students must, must balance teaching responsibilities. So both of those articles, even though they're published um, seven years apart, are both talking about multiple roles related to graduate students being required to teach. So knowing that right off the bat with a synthesis matrix is helpful because you might then choose to group those two articles together within a paragraph and talk about uh, the anxiety graduate students maybe face uh, because of their expectations uh, related to teaching as well as all of the other roles they have. So this is one way to structure a synthesis matrix. North Carolina State University offers a different option. Um, it's pretty much the same thing, um, but across the top, so the first row, they have their sources. And then for that first column, on the left hand side is where they have their um, main topics or main concepts that they're focusing on. You can see that within each of these cells, um, they're using bullet points instead of um, kind of sentences or narrative. Um, so it's really up to you uh, to figure out the best way that works um, to help you synthesize the literature. So Jessica is going to go ahead and post a uh, link in the chat. This is just a template that I created. Um, it has two different sheets within this Excel spreadsheet. One is based off of the Ashford University example, um, where the topics are on the top and the sources are on the left hand side. The other is the North Carolina State, where the sources are on the top and the topics are on the left hand side. So if you find this type of strategy helpful, go ahead and use that um, when you're looking for sources um, and you're starting to think about writing your lit review. Okay, so our last topic related to planning and organizing a lit review is when do you know um, when to stop searching for literature? Again, unfortunately, there's no one size fits all answer. It's gonna differ based on the type of publication or type of writing you're doing, um, what your scope is for your lit review, how comprehensive you're attempting to be. Um, it might also be based on uh, guidelines provided like by a journal publisher, um, depending on what they're looking for in a lit review. Uh, but a few common indicators that you can use um, when you're trying to think about if it's time to stop searching include searching within all relevant resources. So you have searched within all of the top disciplinary databases um, that have coverage for your topic. Maybe you've looked at the top journals. You've also done some research in something like Google Scholar. If you've searched across um, all of these resources um, and you're feeling like you've done a pretty in-depth job with that, that could be an indicator that you're ready to stop searching. If you've utilized various search strategies and keywords across all of those resources um, is a good indicator that you can stop searching as well. So when we're doing something like a lit review, um, it's important to try a lot of different combinations of our keywords when we're looking for our topic. We don't just want to run a single search, pull 20 resources and say we're done with our lit review or we're done finding all of our sources. We need to try a lot of different search options and look in a lot of different places to make sure we're not missing any relevant literature to include. If we've achieved saturation or seeing the same sources repeatedly um, may also be an indicator that we can stop searching. If we have searched within all, within all relevant resources, we've used various strategies across those resources and we're continuing to see the same articles again and again, um, it's likely that we have found the majority of the resources that are relevant to our topic. It's always possible that we've missed one or two sources um, but once you start consistently seeing the same sources again and again, and you're still trying those different search strategies, that's a good indicator um, that you've done 
um, a sufficient job in an in-depth job searching. Lastly, that you found enough sources to justify that your new research is necessary. If you have found sources um, and talked about those sources and analyzed them and you're able to show that your research is filling a gap, um, that's a helpful thing to do as well. Okay, any questions about synthesis matrix, about a synthesis matrix or when to stop searching for literature before we move on to advanced search strategies? Okay. Yeah, nothing, nothing right now. Okay, thanks Jessica. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about three different advanced search strategies and then I'm gonna be doing some live uh, demonstrations using our library website. So we're gonna focus on saving searches and setting search alerts, mining author networks, as well as conducting citation chaining um, or citation searching. So what are the benefits of uh, saving searches? The benefit of saving a search is that it allows you to keep track of where and how you've searched for your topic in the past, and you can return to a specific saved search at any time and rerun the exact same search. So being able to save your searches um, allows you to return to some, somewhere like Web of Science or a ProQuest database, run the exact same search and pick up where you left off, and maybe see new research that's been published on your topic. Uh, this is beneficial um, just because um, it saves you time and it allows you to keep track of what you've done. So somewhat related to saving searches are setting search alerts. So this is very similar to saving your searches, um, but instead of having to return to the resource, log in and run your search manually, uh, search alerts will send you an email when um, that search is ran and new sources appear that meet uh, your specified criteria or um, the criteria you, you have used when you're searching. So this just kind of takes out an extra step and just delivers those sources right to your email. Various library resources have the functionality to save searches and set search alerts. Uh, these include Web of Science Core Collection, Google Scholar, ProQuest databases, and uh, EBSCO host databases. So I'm just going to show you um, a couple of these options. Um, most of them do require you to create an account to save searches. Um, so I'll point out um, when you have to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of my PowerPoint and pull up the library website. So the first resource I want to show you is Web of Science Core Collection. So from the library homepage, I'm just going to click on Web of Science below the search box. And go ahead and open that. And it might take a little bit of time uh, for the library databases to open up since all of us are, um, are working from home because of the smoke. So bear with me while it takes a while. So under select a database, I'm gonna choose Web of Science Core Collection. I prefer to search within that instead of all databases, um, just because it is more of a condensed set of resources and it includes scientific as well as social science um, resources. All, database, all databases search as Web of Science Core Collection, which has all of those um, resources you can see on the right in the description, but it also includes like the BIOSIS Citation Index, the Data Citation Index, and Medline. So if you want to search within all, you're welcome to. I'm just going to search within Web of Science Core Collection. And it remembered my search um, that I was practicing earlier, um, Ebola and the root of the word for vaccine. So if you were in Jessica's research refresher last week, you remember if we put AND in all capital letters between our search keywords, that means every result that we see has to include what comes before and what, af what comes after AND in all capital letters. Then if we take the root of a word, um, like for vaccine, uh, if we put an asterisk at the end of that root, we will get results that include alternative um, variations of that word. So we'll see vaccine, vaccination, um, vaccinations, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and search. And we'll see how long it takes. Okay, didn't take too long. We have over 2000 results. Just to limit our list a bit, I'm going to scroll down and choose article because maybe I don't want to see review articles. I don't want to see editorial material. So I'll click refine. And something else I want to point out about Web of Science, you're not going to see it here because it remembered what I did because I was logged in. Um, but if you're searching, 
um, Web of Science by default sorts your results by date. So they're working on an update to Web of Science and they will sort your results by relevance um, in their new version, but that's not hasn't been released yet. So when you search, check what the sort by is set as and choose relevance. Um, if you're looking for articles to be sorted based on how closely they match your topic and the keywords you used. So if I wanted to set an alert um, for this search so that I could come back here and either run it manually or get an email reminder, I need to click this create an alert button. Now, when I do this, it's going to require me to log in. Um, to set search alerts in Web of Science, you have to create an account. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Let's see if I can type my password here. Okay. Could not do it the first time, so we'll see if the second time works. Okay. Maybe third time's the charm. Nope, okay, so I guess it's not gonna work today. But what you would do is you would click create an alert and once you log in, it'll ask you to name the search alert. You can name it whatever you want and you can check the box to have it send you an email. It will know what your email address is um, because you're already logged into your account with Web of Science. Once you do that, um, you can hit, you'll hit OK. Um, it'll create the alert for you and then there will be the option for you to click just from that same screen to manage your search alerts. Once you click that link, that's where you can choose uh, the frequency, how often you want to receive those alerts. If you want to receive those alerts on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, um, daily. You can also check a box to say, I want to receive an email from Web of Science, even if there aren't any new um, sources um, found with my search. So if you want to just get that notification too, you can check that box. Depending on your discipline, Web of Science might be a really good place to go um, when you're um, doing your searching. So setting an alert um, to be notified when new sources appear within your search can be really helpful in Web of Science. So let me go to another resource really quick. So if we jump into Google Scholar, uh, they also allow you to set search alerts. So I'm just going to do another sample topic. I'm going to say House of Representatives polarization. In Google Scholar, we don't have to use AND in all capital letters. Just putting a space between our keywords um, works the same as AND. So the benefit um, or maybe the difference with search alerts in Google Scholar is that you don't need to create an account by default to have one. Um, I'm not logged into my uh, Gmail account right now, and I can just go ahead and click Create Alert. This is the query or the search that I'm running. I would just type in my email address and tell Google Scholar how many results I want to see in those emails. I can then click Create an Alert. And that alert will be created and I will be notified. The benefit of having a Gmail or a Google account is that you can, um, you have more uh, control over the search alert. So if you want to log in with your Gmail account or create one, you would be able to um, edit the search alert, manage it, uh, change the alert query. If you're not logged in when you create an alert and you wanna make a change, you would just need to then create a whole new alert. So just keep that in mind that um, it's a bit easier than Web of Science because you can do it without an account, um, but you have less control if you don't log in or create create an alert um, with your own account. So the next database that I'm going to show you is a ProQuest database, so we can see how this looks different. I'm going to go into ABI Inform, which is a business database. And I'm just going to search for like cryptocurrency and do the asterisk again to get alternative word endings and check the box for peer reviewed. So a database, um, I think Jessica had mentioned this um, during the research refresher, is that 
um, some of our databases are under kind of larger providers or larger kind of platform companies. So ProQuest is one of those. So ProQuest and EBSCOhost are kind of two of the largest database provider um, platforms or companies, and they have a lot of different subject specific databases within them. So ProQuest has ABI Inform Global, which is um, a business database. It has the dissertations and theses full text database that we talked about in the research refresher. So what I'm going to show you here for ABI Inform will work across any ProQuest database that you visit. Right up here at the top, once you search in the results page, you should see this Save Search Alert button. If you click this, you're given a few different options. The easiest option, if you don't want to create an account, is to click Get Search Link. So once we click this, this is a permanent link that will take us back to this page. It will repopulate the search bar with what we typed in, any other limiters like peer reviewed or specific um, date ranges, it'll, it'll redo those for us. Uh, the only difference is that it will show you new research published that meets those criteria. Um, you can see that this link will expire a year from when you create it, so it's not completely um, permanent, um, but it does last for a significant period of time. You could just copy this URL, email it to yourself, put it in a text document, and then visit it again in the future to re-review um, these results again. If you want to have more control over the search and you want to be able to change it or have results emailed to you, that's when you can choose create an alert. Um, what's nice about ProQuest is um, they offer you two options for creating an alert. You can just create an alert without an account. Um, again, you'll be limited in terms of editing that alert or changing um, the frequency over time. So if you do want to do that and have more control, you can sign up for a My Research account, which is free. But they do let you just create kind of a um, basic alert based on your search, where you would name the alert, it shows you the search that you typed in, the database you're using. You can go ahead and put in whichever email address you want. You can tell it what to include if you want newly published documents or newly added documents, including historical items. You can choose when to have it delivered, as well as how long you want it to last. And the longest it can last is a year. And again, you can check that box to send the alert, even if no new documents match that search. So you could do this without an account, but if you do create an account, that will let you edit or make changes to the options you select. The next option is to save the search. If you want to save the search um, within ProQuest so you can come back to it, that's when you have to create an account. Um, it works the same as getting the search link. Um, this just means when you're saving it, it's stored within your My Research account within ProQuest. So you don't have to save the link somewhere um, and not forget where you put it. Lastly, they offer the option for you to create an RSS feed. Um, this works kind of um, in a similar way to the email alert, um, but it's something that you can integrate directly into your mail provider. Um, so you can add RSS feeds or RSS feeds to your um, out accounts. Um, I think you can probably do it with Gmail or Yahoo or, or whichever type of email um, provider you're using. And the benefit of that, again, is that it will um, kind of automatically, um, an email or an alert will post within your, show up within your email account um, when new articles are published um, or new documents are added, including historic items that meet your search criteria. So if we wanted this, we would just say create feed. And then we would just go ahead and work within our email provider um, to add this RSS feed um, to, that, to that service. If you have questions about doing that, um, there's a lot of good help documentation about adding RSS feeds um, to specific email providers um, online, like through a Google search, but you can also, um, if that's not, if you're not finding what you need, um, you can reach out to the reference desk and we will do our best to help you with that. Okay. So one more database I want to show you, just so you can see how this looks slightly different depending on the provider, is I'm going to go ahead and go into ERIC, which is an EBSCOhost database, so another one of those um, large platforms. And I'm just going to type in, just to sample search, I'm going to do higher education and let's say student loans. So 
So EBSCOhost is kind of similar to the other ones we used that I showed you. They offer various options based on whether or not you want to create an account. If you just want a link to come back to this page, um, have your search terms put back up and repopulated, your you know, limitations reapplied, you can click the share button and then you can get this persistent link to the search. That works that same, the same way as the get the search link that we saw in ABI Inform. Save this in a text document, email it to yourself, and you can come back to this page. If you want to create an email alert, you are going to have to um, sign in and create an EBSCO host account. It's very simple. Um, it's free, just like the My Research account. Um, you're just asked to pretty much put in your email, create a username and a password, and then you have an EBSCO host account. You can set specific parameters um, on your email alerts, which can be really helpful, like we saw um, in ProQuest. Um, you can do the same thing in Web of Science. But they um, also automatically generate an RSS feed link for you. So you can do an RSS feed for any search across any EBSCOhost database um, and incorporate that into your email um, without having an account. So that's helpful if you don't want to do that extra step. You don't want to have to remember more login information. Um, you can always do that RSS feed and get those articles delivered to you um, kind of automatically without you having to create an account through EBSCOhost or ProQuest, like we saw in the other example. Now, a database like EBSCOhost um, does have options where you can add some of the sources you're finding to your folders. So you can see these little folder icons. Um, you can click these, and if we scroll up to the top, we can see that there's some items in our folder. This is helpful while you were within this specific database. Um, you could then email all of them to yourself. You could export them into a citation manager. Um, but these items will not stay in your folder uh, if you close this browser. So once you exit this session of searching, they will go away unless you create and sign into a My EBSCO host account. So whatever you're in a database, something like an EBSCO host database, a ProQuest database, um, and you add things to folders, if you're not signed into their specific accounts, those items will not stay in the folder. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you want to continue to save those items so you can come back to them, you will need to create an account um, and then sign in to make sure you don't lose them. Okay. So, do we have any questions about saving searches or setting search alerts? Okay doesn't look like it from what I can see. So we're just going to go ahead and move on to our next part of advanced searching. And this is mining author networks. So when we're mining author networks, what we're thinking about is who is publishing research on a particular topic and who are their co-authors on related papers. So oftentimes when we're searching, we're focused on finding research on a specific topic that's using maybe the specific keywords that we're searching by. Sometimes it's also helpful to look at who's publishing research on our topic and then look at the other publications that they've had and who they're working with to make sure we're not missing any relevant research that might not be using uh, the terms that we are when we're searching. So two of my favorite resources for mining author networks are Web of Science Core Collection and Google Scholar. So I'm gonna show you how we can do this um, very easily. Let's start in Web of Science. I'm gonna go back to their homepage just by clicking uh, their logo at the very top. And once this page reloads, hopefully, um, we're going to use one of their beta features, and this is only available right now through Web of Science Core Collection. It's called their author search. So if we click on this, um, this is really nice um, because it does a bit of work for you behind the scenes. So if we know an author's last name, like I'm going to do um, uh, Chiang, it kind of gives you some options to make sure you're spelling things correctly. And then once I do that, if I knew the author's first name is Calvin, I can start typing that in. And Web of Science Core Collection is doing work 
um, behind the scenes and saying, okay, we know this is the last name you chose. We're only going to show you first names that we know are connected with that last name. So that can help you a bit if you're unsure about spelling or exactly what their first name of the author is you're looking for. So if we click this, I'm going to go ahead and click find. And this will take me to Web of Science, Web of Science Core Collections record for this author. We can see this is an algorithmically generated record, which means that um, Dr. Cheong doesn't have um, like a specific author account with Web of Science that they've claimed. And that's fine. That's not a big deal. Um, it, but if we scroll down, this is where we can see that um, this author has six publications that are included in Web of Science core collection. So we can see that all of them have something to do um, with finances, cryptocurrency, um, which makes sense because I had found this author's name um, from that ABI inform search on cryptocurrency. And one way, um, what's great about Web of Science is that we can also see kind of a specific author's co-author network. To do that, we would click up here, we would see view as a set of results to export, analyze, and link to full text. If we click this, it's gonna show us all six of those articles or 20 articles or 100 articles, depending who the author is. It's gonna show us them in a results list that looks similar to a search in Web of Science. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna click analyze results. And this is going to do some work and show us a lot of different data about these six articles published by Dr. Um, Chiang. We can see things like publication year, author is selected by default. And if we scroll down, we can see that um, it looks like there was probably one article where this author didn't use their second middle initial, the H, but we can see that they've published with one article with Lee, two of the articles with um, Grandma Sammy, um, two of the articles with um, Sina Canu, and then one article with Weissman. So if we wanted to see any of these specific articles that they've published with one of these authors, we would just hover over the author name and say view records. So this looks um, maybe less cool or useful when there's only six articles, but if you're looking at an author who has, you know, 20, 30, 100 articles, being able to get a visualization and a list of their co-authors, how often they've published with them, and then limit your search results just to those specific articles can be really helpful and make sure that you're not missing anything related to your topic. We can do the same thing in Google Scholar by doing an advanced search. So if we click on that hamburger icon and go under advanced search, we can again search by the author's name. It's less um, structured than in Web of Science um, and they ask you to search by um, the author's um, initials and then their last name in quotation marks. And so if we search, we can see that there's a couple of different ways to access an author record. Um, we can see um, all of their articles that they're publishing, um, but since um, this specific author has created um, kind of a, I'm trying to think what it's called, it's kind of like a Google Scholar account, um, our colleague Marco is going to be talking about this in a future workshop, um, but they've kind of created an account with Google Scholar to track their um, own publications, and so they have an author record in Google Scholar. So if you click on this, you can see all of their publications as well as kind of the number of citations. So this could help you take a look and see um, where have they published. What's interesting is there are way more than six articles in Google Scholar um, when there, we only saw six in Web of Science. So when you are searching and you are looking for author networks, it's important to look in both Web of Science as well as something like Google Scholar, because oftentimes they're polling from different places. So it's important to check both to make sure you're not missing anything. Uh, that's another good reason to make sure when you're doing a lit review that you're searching across multiple resources instead of limiting yourself to just one. Now, this specific record um, doesn't show us anything about co-authors um, because Dr. Cheong hasn't added um, or claimed any co-authors on their account. Let me just show you that there was one example of an author who did. So you can see what this looks like. So their name, 
um, was Lucas um, Menkoff. Let me see if I can spell this correctly. So there, they have an author record too, but since they have claimed some co-authors, we can come down here and see that list. We could then click on their names and see their author records um, and their publications. So that works in a similar way to Web of Science. It just looks slightly different. So depending um, on where you want to start, um, choose one of those resources and then do that same author search um, and the other to make sure you're not missing anything. So the last thing that I want to talk about before we're done today is uh, citation chaining. So citation chaining is one of my favorite things um, to teach and to tell students about, um, students, faculty, and staff, because it can save you time and help you find um, articles that are related to your topic um, without having to do extra searching. So citation chaining is a strategy in which you use a single source to find related searches. So you're starting with one source and then you are um, kind of building off, off of that search or off of that source. Citation chaining is helpful and, it, and it's beneficial because it helps you trace the roots of important ideas and discover how a topic has changed over time without having to continue to change your search. There's two types of citation chaining. The first is backward citation chaining, so going back in the past from a source, and forward, which is looking ahead um, from that first search, for first source. Um, so backward citation chaining is pretty much where you start with a single source and you mine their literature reviews and their reference list. So a lot of us do this when we're doing research, while we're reading an article that's really relevant to our topic, we might highlight or circle other articles that we want to find and then look at. So the steps for this are to find a source of interest, determine whether it's available full text, because if it's not, you really can't look at its reference list. Um, if it's not available right away, go ahead and submit um, an interlibrary loan request if it's an article. Um, you might also submit a summit request if it's a book that one of our partner libraries has. Once you have the full text in front of you, you can examine its in-text citations, whether they're in the introduction or the lit review, look at its reference list, start identifying articles that you want to go back to and find and read, identify those sources, and then lastly, determine their full text avail um, availability and request them via interlibrary loan or other um, mechanisms if you need to. So this is pretty straightforward, um, and it's really just about finding a source, getting the full text, reading through it and using its reference list to find other sources. What I want to focus on is forward citation chaining because Web of Science, Core Collection, and Google Scholar kind of do this work for you. Forward citation chaining is where you can find sources that cited your original source. So if we have a source that was published in 2004, citation chaining allows us to identify those sources published afterwards that used that specific source or cited it in their own research. So we're jumping ahead um, kind of within the history of our topic. The steps are very similar to backward citation chaining. You find a source of interest, you visit Web of Science Core Collection or Google Scholar. I would say start with one and then visit the other because the number um, of cited by is gonna differ or it's likely to differ based on the resource. Search for the title of the source that you're interested in. Click time cited if you're in Web of Science Core Collection or cited by in Google Scholar and then determine the full text availability. So let me show you. This is very, very simple. I'm going to jump back into Web of Science. We can see here, because we already did a search, like let's say that we were searching for on the predictability, on the predictability of carry trade returns. Over here, we can see that this article published in 2017 has been cited three times. So if we wanted to see those articles that cited this one, we would just click that. Forward citation chaining is really helpful because oftentimes um, when someone is citing research in their own work, they're doing work that is similar. They might be using a similar method, covering a similar topic, um, or adding something new to that topic. The same way that when you're citing literature or sources in your own lit review, you're doing research that's similar. Now we can see um, that these articles that cited it haven't been cited very often yet, which makes sense. These articles were published in 2019, 2018, 2018. 
the more recent an article is, the less likely it's already to have, it's all, the less likely it is to have citations already. Um, that's just because it takes a long time to do research um, and to get it published and then for someone else to read that research and cite it in their own work. So forward citation um, chaining works best when the article is a little bit older um, because then we can see um, kind of the impact it's had in the field. So if we come into Google Scholar, I'm just going to do another, let's just search for that same search so we can see. So the good thing about Web of Science or Google Scholar is if you're already searching there, you can do that time cited or cited by without having to do the extra step of searching by the title. But if you were in something like a database like ABI Inform or maybe in our library catalog, you can then copy that title of the article and then paste it into one of these resources to get the um, citation counts. So this first article we can see has been cited by 178 other um, articles or sources. Um, this one's by 131. This book has been cited by 349. If we click on that link, we will get a list of those sources. And if we click search within citing articles, we can limit that list by adding additional keywords. So we might add something else related to our topic. We might say, okay, of these 349 articles that cited the original source I'm interested in, I'm only interested in articles that mention re-election. When we do that, that limits our search um, to 160. So of that original 349 articles, 160 mentioned re-election. So doing something like going backwards um, through the history of a topic by looking at reference lists um, from a particular source and then jumping ahead in the future by doing time cited or cited by saves you time because you're finding these sources based on the identification of one source that is closely related to your topic. You're not having to do a lot of extra searching. You're generating these lists based on a single source. And you can do this with any source you find. Um, some sources, especially if they're more recent um, or less well known, might not have citations and that's okay. That doesn't mean that that research um, shouldn't be included in your lit review. Um, it just means that um, you just kind of can't get that easy time cited list generated. Okay, so I haven't seen um, any questions come through in chat. Um, we have about eight more minutes, so I will stay on if you have questions. Um, we do have some upcoming workshops, so please consider signing up for those. We have tools for building our scholarly presence, and that's taught by our colleague Marco. Um, and that one's going to be really interesting. Um, if you're interested in um, kind of what it means to be a scholar, how to create things like ORCID IDs, author profiles, what alt metrics are, that's a great um, workshop for you to attend. Uh, my colleague Jessica, who's managing the chat and who did the research refresher workshop, is teaching um, a workshop on citation management with Zotero. Zotero is a citation manager that can save you time. Um, so definitely sign up for that if you're interested in citation management. Um, then we also have other workshops related to Microsoft Word and Excel. Um, in October, we have workshops on organizing research and data management, um, which will talk about file organization strategies, storage options, and tips to manage your workflows when analyzing data. That will be a really good workshop. And then lastly, we have one on creating a research poster. This is gonna focus on creating posters for the digital environment, uh, since many of our conferences are online um, because of COVID-19 and things like that. This will be very helpful. Um, and lastly, if you have a chance, please fill out the post um, workshop survey link that Jessica is going to put into the chat um, just to share your feedback so we know um, kind of what, what you hope to learn in the future and what you found helpful about uh, this workshop and what we can do um, to improve um, and add um, more content um, next fall when we offer the series again. So thank you all for attending. If you have questions, we still have a few more minutes. Feel free to ask them via chat. Um, but if not, uh, please sign up for the other workshops and we look forward to seeing you. I'll be sending out the link to the recording of this workshop once it gets posted on the library's YouTube account. So thank you all.